You're listening to episode 112, Empowering Yourself to Break Free of the Patterns of Abuse, with Dr. Rose Mina. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome, and thanks for tuning in for this episode. I really do appreciate it. And today we're going to be joined by Dr. Rose Mina, author of The Book of Rose, Rituals of Self-Empowerment. Rose is a survivor of sexual abuse, which took place in East Africa, where she's originally from. So you'll hear a little different perspective of what Rose experienced because of where she's from and the different types of ways that someone can be ritualized and brainwashed in the African culture. And in fact, Rose thought her experience was the norm and didn't know it was considered abuse until she came to the U.S. And then because of the rituals and and brainwashing and programming that she experienced, Rose continued to be abused even though she was no longer in that environment. So she'll tell us about that and she'll also talk about how being born into sexual abuse made her confused about what love was later on in life. She's going to share the moment when she came to realize that it was abuse and the reaction it caused for her, and how healing became important to her because of the work that she was doing, and what influenced her to become president of her own life, as she likes to say, and what that meant for her. And she'll share a technique that she's used to reprogram herself, and she'll talk about why it's hard for survivors to take good care of themselves, and a tool called 21 Activities that she's used that helps you do things for you and focus on self-care. And she'll talk about how her book came to be because for a while she was hesitant to share her story publicly and lots of other stuff as well. So I think this can be an inspiring story regardless of what type of abuse you may have experienced and that you can be able to take something away from it. Now, I do want to issue a trigger warning. Even though we talk a lot about empowering yourself and focus on the healing, If you've been sexually abused, then you could find some of what Rose talks about to be upsetting. And I also just want to mention that I was having a little bit of an off day when we recorded this, so if I sound a little off, that's why. And maybe I'm just being a little too hard on myself, but I just don't feel like I did my best. So that's all, but Rose is awesome and she's a great storyteller. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into this one and I'll bring Rose on. Rose, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Thank you so much for having me on, Melissa. I'm so looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. Um, So when I first heard about your story, I thought it would be a good fit for the show. I know you've gone from being an African child sex slave to a survivor and a children's advocate, and you have a book that came out recently where you share how you've been able to overcome what you went through growing up to get to where you are today. And I know you're passionate about helping others who have been sexually abused. And I certainly have listeners who are survivors of sexual abuse as well as other types of abuse. And I think your story can be inspiring to any survivor. So what I like to do, Rose, is start out with your story of what you experienced growing up so that we have that context. And then we'll go from there and talk about the things that have helped you in your healing. How does that sound? This would be wonderful. Yeah, so just kind of, you know, tell us what happened. Well, you know, it was a form of bullying. When a baby is born and the first thing you're doing is um, availing the baby to be sexually assaulted and harassed and in a violent situation. My first sexual experiences were when I was a young baby. And this continued for many, many, many years. Uh, You know, I got used to it. That was my first experience of love. And so I was very confused for many, many years after what real love is. I didn't have love. I did not have trust. I did not have respect. Things that children normally grow up with, that was zero for me because it was in bullying 
it was in assault and harassment and violence. And I just remember being transported to different places and adults taking advantage of me as a young baby and as a young girl growing up. And that's the life I knew. I didn't even know it was um, abuse. I thought that was the normal way to live. Mm-hmm. You know, they gave me presents and they, they, they told me how wonderful I was. In fact, my names were Marilyn Monroe. Another name I had was Shirley Temple because during the time I was being sexually violated as a young child, the TV was on and programs from the United States and other parts of the world would be, you know, on the TV. I grew up in East Africa, specifically Kenya. I was born in Uganda and then transferred to Kenya and the American TV would be playing or, you know, a show and Marilyn Monroe was on there and the abusers or the people who are abusing me would say, oh, you're just like Marilyn Monroe. You're so beautiful. And for a long time, that was programmed in me that I was. And these were good acts that I was acting, being a superstar, being a singer like, you know, Michael Jackson or any of these. So this was the programming that was there. So I was very proud to be, you know, involved in these activities because I was being like an American movie star, an American pop pop singer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people are programming children like this, it's, it's very, very hard. Yeah. And so coming to United States at 23 to do graduate studies, I really wanted to learn about children. And I learned about child abuse, but I never connected the dots. The reason I never connected the dots is because what they were describing was terrible. Who would do that to a child? Underneath, you know, there was a deep feeling of, you know, acknowledgement. And I began to be triggered and the more I worked with young children and, you know, incidences where they had been abused or there was, uh, you know, they, they, you know, the parents told me, oh, I left my child with, with their uncle and the uncle raped them. You know, I'd start getting angry inside for whatever reason. And I'll never forget the day that Elizabeth, um, Diane Sawyer was on TV and she was talking about a baby from South Africa that had been raped by six men so that they could get rid of their AIDS, because there was a belief at that time that this was the way to get rid of AIDS was, you know, you couldn't get more um, virginal than a baby. And so this was spreading across Africa saying, you know, rape a young, the youngest child you can find and you'll be overcome by AIDS. And so they showed this baby and I don't know what happened to me. You know, uh, Melissa, I got so angry. I picked up the knife and I was walking around my coffee table in my living room, like I wanted to kill these people. Mm. And it just triggered this whole new world underneath that had been hidden so long until I was ready to handle it. And that's when the realization hit me that I had been raped since I was a baby. And I can tell you that that was the day that, honestly, I wanted to take my life. Mm. Because to have lived so long, I mean, such lies. And for the people that are supposed to be protecting you, your own mother, you know, my father had died, you know, a um, long time ago, but to be raised by a woman who called herself a mother and she had rented me out, had raped me herself, had, you know, had her friends and her clientele, it was just, it was too much for me. It was better for me to take my life. Mm-hmm. So wow, from so- there on, yeah, so so that was the moment when you realized that yes. what you exper- what you had experienced was abuse. Yes, and so you know it it was you know first denial and then the acceptance came in that yes this had happened to me mm-hmm. and then I was what, faced. Was it, a- oh, sorry, yeah, I was just going to ask: Was this happening to a lot of other children where you came from as well? Did yes. You, did you see it happening too? Yes, to my siblings, to the people they called my siblings and the other children, because you have to remember in East Africa, there are lots of extended families, you, you know, and we blend and, you know, it's almost like everybody's your brother and sister because that's how we grow up. There's no real separations, you know, when it comes to a family. And so this was a private sex ring, you know, very well hidden, you know, and just like, you know, today, these are very well hidden. You know, mm-hmm. they see children on the web and everything is very well hidden. You know, nobody's coming out. You have special passwords and everything. I'm even back before the internet, this was happening, you know? 
And so when I think about it, you know, the healing process was very important for me. Here I was teaching child development, telling people that it was possible to heal. And then here was my life and it was deep in, you know, sucking. It was sucking very deeply because I couldn't even, (laughs) you know, follow my own advice, you know. Yeah. And so you were uh, 23 when you came here to the U.S. Yes. Yes. Um, Is that when the abuse had stopped? Well, because I was no longer with the woman I was studying, but Mm -hmm. still her presence was there because, you know, I had been ritualized, I'd been brainwashed, I had been programmed. I called her every two weeks or every month. So the programs were still kept alive. You know, in ritualistic, spiritual Africa, you, you can communicate with people even when they're far away to reinforce things, Mm. you know, it's just like intuition, you know, those deep passages, people believe in God, you know, and, and that's a deep belief that if your abuser is God, then there's a deep belief there, you know, when they cross those lines, because children don't know who God is, you teach them who God is. So if you have taught the child that God is you, then, you know, where, where are we going with this? The child does believe that. So whenever I'd pray, I'd always see her, even when I was 23, you know, I'd see this woman and, you know, guiding me and and telling me how much she loved me. And, you know, so it was very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so you were just continuing to be abused, even though you were out of the situation. Yes, Um, physically, but now spiritually, mm -hmm. you see, mentally and emotionally. Yeah, that's where you're haunted. That's where. Those programs are so hard to break, Melissa, because Mm -hmm. this is the way I breathe. This is the only way I know. This is my survival. I was a baby. I didn't know anything else. Yeah. So when did that kind of come to an end? Or when were you able to, um, you know, stop communicating with her? You know, it's the strangest thing. But when President Obama took office, I realized it was my time to become president of my own life. Mm. And so that was 2008 when he took office. Now we're in 2017. And I have been um, the president of my life. What that meant was that's the day I decided that I could take control, full control of my life, that I did not need any outside people controlling me. It was time now to stop looking at the past like I cannot do anything about it. And decide, like, just like President Obama, which was just the most impossible thing for my mind at that time, that uh, you know, to have an African American president of a super nation, I never thought that could happen in my lifetime. But when I saw that happen, I said, I can change my life. You know, if America can change a whole super nation, then I can change my life. And for some people, we need it to be that big because you have to remember I was a baby. So, you know, I didn't know anything else. This was the biggest thing for me that helped me shift my consciousness at that point. Mm -hmm. And so when I entered into the full control of my life, oh, my God, you know, I was able to start really looking at the abuse fair and square. It was like this big dragon that I had to slay, you know, and take back my castle and the princess, which was me, you know, the little baby. I had to go rescue that baby and and love that baby. And so when I realized that I had to love that baby and realized also that I had to reparent the baby, teach the parent, teach a little baby love. Teach her what what she didn't learn. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was like reaching my hand out to somebody, something, a baby that I didn't want to connect with because we have to remember I was a professor. I was Dr. Rose Minor. I had built a school in the inner city. I had many big, you know, hurrahs, you know, celebrations. And then here I am going back to a past that was just going to, you know, destroy me Mm -hmm. in my mind at that time. I didn't want to connect to that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, Rose, you've got to connect to that because that's where your power source is. If you can't get that baby back, then you shouldn't be teaching child development because child development is all about children. You've got to get that baby, you know. Yeah, it, so it was a hard thing for you to face, but something that you recognized was necessary in order to be able to to continue to do the work that you do. Yes. If I can't get back my baby, then I have no uh, you know, <laughs> leg to stand on teaching child development and telling people that they can change their lives as they go back to their childhood traumas and, and heal them. Mm-hmm. So I had to lead by example. Yeah. So what did you start to do? How did you start to, to heal? 
You know, one of the most powerful things that I did was journaling. I was known for keeping journals since I was 15 years old. And journaling is a tough thing to do, especially when you want to tell the truth. And for me at that point, finding that that, that had been lied to, that was the journals of rage. I have a couple of journals where I just wrote terrible things. I was going to come after this woman. I just got it all out. It was just a vomiting place. It was, you know, journals are very personal. I tell people keep a, a journal that is locked if you have to, so that you have an opportunity to to just voice out. I'm a writer, so it, the best way for me to to do this is to write. For some people, they need to go somewhere and scream it out. One of my friends, that's what she did. She went and sat at the ocean, where you know, on a very early morning, and just yelled at, at the ocean. It's a big force, and oceans are very loving places, you know. And she was able just to dump that awful, you know, hate that she had within. So, and I have another friend and he, when he found out that he had been sexually violated by his uncles and a priest, he was able just to go to a bridge and he wrote out what he, what he felt and just put the paper into the water and saw the, the paper flow down past him. So it was like, it was water under the bridge. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So people use different techniques. I had one lady that, you know, had been violated in Afghanistan. She was a soldier and she had been raped while she was there and, you know, serving America. And when she came back, I just told her, where's your uniform? And she says, I have it. I said, why are you holding on to that? That has, you know, a lot of terrible energies on it. So she says, should I burn it? I said, yes, burn it. But we're going to have a ceremony around it because we're going to get you back. And so we burnt the uniform and her life completely, she was able to put an end to that abuse. So there are very many techniques that, you know, I have used myself and I've helped other people use. With There's so many in spiritual Africa. We have a lot of things that we do to help people overcome difficult circumstances. These, these processes are not well known here. We know of the Asian, some of the Asian process, processes through the, you know, the, the meditation of yoga mm -hmm. and what you but many people don't understand the African spiritualism and, you know, the animalism and how those processes can really heal you very, very quickly, very rapidly. Mm. And um, through my meditation, deep meditation, which I learned from the Native American tribes that are here, I spent four months in Idaho and I learned how to very deeply meditate using the Native American processes of the Sioux and the or Blackfoot Indians. And through that, I was able to connect with my spirituality in East Africa and those processes. They said, don't be afraid. This is part of you, Rose. This is part of your genetic code. This is Africa. You've got to heal this. And you've got to accept that you are also a shaman. And you also have some powerful gifts to give to this world. And when I connected there, honestly, Melissa, I began to open up. And I began to realize that I can help people using some of these processes that were so viciously used against me to now help other people get out of difficult circumstances, whatever they be, whether it's bullying, abuse or divorce or a death of a, a lost one or a child that has autism. I began to see my potential, which I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. Wow. No, I think that's that's great how you were able to do that. And you know, like you were saying, I mean, it's important to kind of to find, you know, a, a means of letting out, you know, what it is that you went through and, and just kind of, you know, symbolically, like cleansing that from your system and to start start to move past it. Um, so yeah, I think it's great how, how you were able to do that for yourself. And I mean, thanks for sharing the things that you, you know, that you've used in your own uh, process. You know, I was thinking about something that I should mention to everybody here. It is very, very important that if you have been brainwashed in a certain way and programmed in a certain way, that you begin to look at how you can reprogram yourself. And there are very many techniques out there of reprogramming of self. And one of the powerful ones I used was looking at my life as lemons and realizing that I can change anything and make lemonade from the lemons that I was given in my life. That is a very simple, um, you know, analogy, but it's huge in its power because you look at the things that you have been through and you say, okay, 
this, I could not control what happened to me as a child, but I can control what happened to me as an adult. And this is where you begin to change. And I believe, I have a very, very strong belief that you can change anything in your life. And that is what I believe has been the thing that has helped me the most is this strong belief that anything can be changed. And that's how I approach anybody who has been sexually violated, especially my students that I teach in child development, because I tell them that it's so important for you to heal this in your life because you're going to be working with young children. And if we can catch the children early, you know, if we find them being bullied or, you know, there's somebody harassing them, molesting them, we can we can rescue them, you know, sooner. So they don't have to go into, you know, being autistic and being silenced or whatever other things happen to young children. Because some of the special needs that we see in children today have come as a result of this violence. I know this because the children were born normally. They start getting sexually harassed or abused, and then they develop all these elements that people have so many words to describe it. I had dyslexia for a long time. And even to this day, when I write on the board, I must check my spelling, you know, because sometimes I switch some words around when I'm writing the theories of child development down or what have you. So yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the ways that you can be affected by it. Yes. And, you know, going along with another thing that really, really helped me and helped one of my uh, clients was having a self-focus. And I call it an extreme self-focus. You have to remember that those of us who have been sexually violent, violated, we have been giving our lives to other people. They have had the focus. So when you come to extreme self-focus, you remove that focus from those people, for me, for my pedophiles, and bringing that focus back to me. So I had to have extreme self-focus, but it has to express itself in activities. And so I developed something I call the 21 activities that I had to do daily for myself. I mean, totally just for me. It involved a pedicure, it involved washing the dishes, making my bed, doing all the things that I was not doing because I was in extreme self-sabotage. I was actually trying to destroy myself. And it, that's how you feel when you've been sexually violated. You want to destroy yourself. And it comes into, it, it expresses itself in self-harm. One of my students had been cutting herself for many, many years. And when she came to my classroom and she heard my story, it's, she started stopping that, you know, self-harm. And she let me take a picture of herself. She had never worn shorts and short-sleeved um, shirts. But when she came to my class, that began to change because once again, my focus is, is that you need to heal yourself if you're going to be working with children because they have very deep needs. And so, you know, she, during the two semesters she's been with me, she's now comfortable to wear the shorts and the short sleeves. Before she used to cover herself head to toe because she was uncomfortable showing all those bruises and cuts. But now because she's in that self-healing cycle, it, you know, she's bolder now and she's been able to talk about what happened to her and why that happened to her. So we've had a lot of successes and the 21 activities is of extreme self-focus, acti you know, things you do for just you every day or even once a week. That has shifted a lot of people that I have shared this with very, very quickly. Mm. So these could be things that are specific to each individual person. Like it's not, there's not a list of 21 specific things that everybody should be doing. Like each person should come up with their own list. Yes, because you are unique. What turns you on is not what turns me on. I love reading. I love learning. So that was one of my 21 things was to read a book once a week or every day, something that I love to read, you know, and for some, one of my students, it was her hair, her nails. She wasn't taking care of her hair or her nails. So she started taking, you know, better self-grooming, going to the visit to get her teeth done, get braces, you know, things that we put off because we're so busy, traumatized that we're not taking, you know, care of ourselves. Self-care is very important. You know, one of my students used to come in and she was really smelly. And part of the smelliness was because of the abuser. She didn't want to groom herself or anything because when she was with her abuser, she was very well groomed and everything. So she associated being well groomed with abuse. Mm -hmm. So we had to break that connection and bring her back to being self groomed that it's for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To make it something that um, doesn't cause you 
pain anymore doesn't trigger you. Yes, because the positive things you were doing, Melissa, were with your abuser or, you know, the person who was harassing you. So you associate those good things with that person. So you, you don't want to do those things when you're healing. And so it's a, it's a difficult, you know, turnaround to realize that, you know, you have to take care of yourself. I was not taking care of myself. For three years, I could not organize myself out of a paper bag because being organized meant that meant abuse. So it took me three years to dismantle that religious ritualized, you know, spiritual um, program from Africa that keeps me enslaved with my pedophile. And it took three years to take that down. And once I did, I started seeing lots of improvements. I started doing my banking properly. I stopped playing, paying late fees. I was constantly in late fees, you know, and completely disorganized. It was awful to be that disorganized. But, you know, we're working through it. People don't realize it just your life doesn't work anymore. And when you're dismantling this huge program of abuse, sometimes, you know, the good things you are doing there that have been associated with abuse now become, you know, like your Achilles heel, so as to speak. Mm -hmm. And making peace with that and realizing that you can rescue that organized self of yourself without abuse is very helpful. Mm -hmm. And you also have to go easy on yourself during this process too, don't you? As you're, you know, relearning these things and figuring out the right way to, uh, to do things, you know? A lot of self-love. Mm -hmm. You enter into the journey, which I call self-love. And it is a very powerful program. Of course, it's a journey. My journey took me 12 years. I'm now out of the abuse, totally. I, I, you know, totally out of it, but it took me 12 years. But it won't take people that long because I was a baby. I was born into this. A lot of people are not born into these things, you know. So, you know, for me, it took a little longer, but I've noticed with my students, one particular student, her uncle violated her at late at night for three, four years. I taught her the sun visualization technique. The sun is very important in East Africa. And so this is one of the processes as a, you know, that I was, I learned, relearned when I connected back to my, you know, the shaman qualities I had. And so she was able to utilize this sun visualization exercise technique. And honestly, you should have seen her face. She moved from complete sadness to a joy. I have never seen anybody transfer, you know, transform so quickly with one technique. And she just got happy. She was such a happy person. And she started referring people to my class. Oh, you must take her class. It was the most amazing thing. And every time I see her on campus, the first person she runs to is me and gives me a hug. She's just a happy human being. But before that, she was really, really sad. Those four years that she spent in that sexual abuse with her uncle really, really hurt her soul and her spirit. And so it's just a matter of knowing, you know, what, what will help you. You know, some people, you know, go to a therapist, some people go to a counseling, some people journal, some people find a person like me, some people, you know, find a church that has, you know, a community that's caring, you know, you have to find what it is that's going to work for you. And once it works, oh my God, it's, it's like freedom, freedom at last, you know? <clears throat> Yeah, no, that's that's incredible. It can be such a long process, um, and you know, one that you might think you know you're you're never gonna get through, because there's so much, you know, reprogramming and relearning of things, um, especially when you never learn them to begin with, and you have to learn them from scratch. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's a difficult thing, but. You know, as you're as you're talking about here, I mean, it's absolutely possible to do, and it's about finding the right resources to make that happen, and being patient with yourself. You know, focusing on on self love and self care during that process. Um, so, Rose, how how are you doing today? And are there things that you know you still struggle with? What I'm still struggling with right now is organizing my home. My home right now is a clutter a clutterbug. I'm a clutterbug. I keep so many things around me. I, I, I have a, a, a tendency to feel like it protects me. The more I have, the more it protects me. So I'm learning 
and I'm reprogramming myself right now to live with less. It could even be a newspaper that I've held on to that I really love. It was 2006 and it had a great story. I'm not able to let go of it right now. And so I'm relearning and reprogramming. And it goes with holding on to abuse, holding on to some things from abuse. And that's the track that I'm working with right now. Now, you have to understand I have to go easy on myself and I have to be very patient because this is how I breathe. This is my survival. I was a baby. This was the only life I knew. So one time I moved too fast and I found myself stuck in the shower for two full hours because my, my, it seemed like my spinal cord just froze and I wasn't able to move for two hours. I had moved too quickly for my subconscious and uh-huh. it wasn't letting me release that program. So I've learned as I've been reprogramming myself to be very, very careful because some of these processes that are used to brainwash children in a life of sexual slavery, what pedophiles are using today is highly sophisticated. And you need to be really patient, really listen deep so that you know the chants or you know what the words they used. And this is deep. We've gone a little deep because there are some people in your in your group that I, you know, that may have this, you know, that they have been religiously ritualized, you need to listen very carefully. And the only way you're going to be able to listen to this is in meditation, learning how to meditate deeply. And it was a real shock for me, Melissa, when I went to yoga class, you know, everybody talks about the benefits of yoga and I wanted them. My body needed, you know, some exercise I could do easily and regularly. So I went to yoga class very happily, bought my mat, mat, said, this is a new thing I'm doing for Rose. It's extreme self-care. But when the teacher told us, you know, go, um, and we went, um, and then she put the gong and then I went deeper into meditation. Guess what I heard? I heard another completely different conversation going on deep in my subconscious. And that conversation went exactly like this. Do it this way. Turn your tongue this way. Do it this way. And it was all about the sexual instructions from Mm. my pedophile on how to service her and her clients. This is what I found in the deeps of yoga, Uh yoga class. And I was so horrified. I picked up my mat and ran out of that class because I was like, oh, my God. And it was like, Houston, we have a problem. Because (laughs) at that point, I had no idea that I had all these private speech messages deep down in my subconscious that were held subliminally, that were held, you know, um, on a deep subconscious level. And so now I had to learn how to go deeper in my subconscious to remove that programming. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, and to kind of uh, shift gears a little bit. So I know your uh, book came out recently called The Book of Rose, v- Rituals of Self-Empowerment. When did you first go public with your story? Because I know, like you were talking about earlier, like, um, you know, there was a little bit of of shame there given the work that you do. Um, So when were you able to to go public with that? I went public in October of 2008. Um, It was in my classroom and I was teaching them about child sexual abuse, child physical abuse and child verbal abuse and mental, you know, going through that you know, you have to teach them this so that they can pick it up in young children. And I remember breaking down and that's when I told them my story. And it was at that point, a hidden thing, something I was hiding. And, um, when I came open, it was so liberating and my students and I cried, you know, and some of them opened up at that point. And then from that point on, every time I taught that section, I was able to tell my story and tell my story and see, you know, people opening up and telling their story. We're breaking the code of silence. And so from 2008 to this day, we're breaking the code of silence. And one of my students, a couple of them would come up to me and say, Rose, you should really write your story. You really should because, you know, you really helped me. You changed my life. You know, I've gone to many classes, but this class has really changed my life. And so I said, well, I don't want to write my story. You know, I'm a doctor. I think, why would I go back to that life? You know, why would I even tell people that? It's (laughs) for you guys, you know? And I remember that I was trying to achieve some things in my life. It was um, 2015, 2016, zero accomplishments. You know, I was trying to lose weight. You know, I was trying to move my bank account, you know, increase my funds. 
nothing was working. You know, even the things I wanted to do professionally in my career, like teach at a four year college or teach on a, you know, on a doctoral level, because I was in community college teaching, nothing of that was happening. And I saw, kept seeing this invisible wall, you know, in front of me. I kept seeing it. I said, what is this? I've already, you know, overcome this child abuse. What is this wall? And that wall represented my refusal to, to go ahead and share my story on a broader scale, to do what my students were telling me to do. It was just an invisible wall. It's like here I have all these beautiful techniques, beautiful ways to help people, and I'm keeping them all to myself and only keeping myself in a small circle. And that's when the Book of Rose came to being. My name happens to be Rose, but it actually stands for Rituals of Self-Empowerment because that's exactly what I did. I self-empowered me through all these processes that I, you know, that I utilized and I self and I taught my students those self-empowering techniques. So that's when I wrote the book. It took two weeks to write, by the way. Wow. It, it was yeah. ready to it, go. It was it, ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was me blocking. And that's why I wasn't allowed to do anything else until I wrote the story. Now, since I wrote the story in December 2016, it became an international bestseller by by February. March, it was in physical form. April, I was, you know, being called, you know, to New York and places to start speaking about it. So it's been like, uh, you know, an, you know, very fast happening, you know, because I was able to be obedient and just say, OK, it's time to share. It's time to tell people they can get over this, no matter how horrific. My story is very horrific. There are places I could never tell people what happened to me because I will not repeat those words so that other people can abuse children that way. So it stays, the secrets die with me, you know, but the process is that I can teach people that can really shift them out of bad circumstances, whatever it may be very quickly. Mm. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm sure that you sharing your, your story has been helping a lot of people. And I'm, that's why I was glad to have you, you know, come on the podcast to share it here as well. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Bullying, being bullied, you know, sexually abused children have been bullied, you know, deeply, but it's been in the sexual realm, which is, you know, sex makes people one, you know, beautiful sex is, is extremely, extremely um, beautiful. But when you have been sexually assaulted as a child, sex is not a beautiful thing. It is a very hurtful thing. It's a bully of a parent or whoever was bullying you to do those things that were inappropriate for young children. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do today and everything you have going on. Today is an interesting day. I always tell people that I'm lucky to be alive. I'm lucky to be actually walking because when I meet other sexual, sexually violated individuals, we confide in each other. We're doing things behind doors, you know, uh, living desperate lives. They call we, they call it drinking. Some of us have mental issues, some of us, you know, self-harming. And so I began to realize that, you know, there is a way to help people who are involved in this. I was involved with eating a lot of sugar behind closed doors. Sugar was my thing, everything with sugar. And I guess that's why, you know, I have a problem with weight because of the sugar. So I decided that, you know, I needed to develop a weight loss program for people like me who have, you know, these issues because I couldn't find any weight loss programs that were working for me. So I decided to write one and for sexually abused individuals, because the reason why we hold on to that weight is protection. I know I was holding on to my weight for protection. If I'm big and strong, nobody's going to mess with me, you know? Mm. And so, um, so far it's been 15 pounds and I'm very proud of it. Um, this year it's been 50, it's now come, it's a total of 15 I started it, you know, a year ago. We're now in June and 15 pounds. Now, people are not going to be excited about 15 pounds, but what about if I told you it will never come back on because we've healed the issue of why you're holding on to that weight, right? So, yeah, that's I mean, that, that's an example of like, you know, something that served us in the past that's no longer serving us now. And, you know, the best thing is for us to find a way to to get rid of that, you know, to, to change that pattern. Yes. And another thing that I changed, another pattern I changed today was I had a very deep hate of women and men, you know, which wasn't helping me in my life. 
you know, I loved my students, I loved young children, but I really had issues with adults because those are the people that hurt me when I was a child. And so this year and last year, I specifically zoned into that. And I'm, I'm really happy to report to you that I have some of the most incredible relationships now today than I had, you know, years ago, because I've been able to mend those fences, you know, and people don't realize that you live with those, you know, um, effects of child abuse that, you know, you don't trust people, you don't respect them, you don't um, let them come into your inner world and inner circles, you know, you keep people at a distance, you don't trust them. And so, wow, to have relationships that I have today is unbelievable, you know, to me, because I didn't have these relationships. I had real issues of trust. Mm, that's incredible. Yes. <laughs> so today <laughs> uh, you asked me what I'm doing. I'm pushing forth with the Book of Rose. I've written the Reparent Program, which is the program I used you know, many years ago to reparent me, to teach me how to be a parent you know, to the little girl that was violated, the little baby. So that book will be coming out hopefully this year. It's very hard to birth a book. Um, especially one that is on a, such a deep levels as I have gone with this one. So I'm kind of finding the right audience for this book because, you know, not everybody needs to be reparented, but there's some of us that really deeply need a parent because if that parent violated you sexually, yes, that, that we, we have a problem. We really do. So that is why I wrote this program for those of us that are suffering there, because imagine if I still had to keep in touch with this um, pedophile of a mother, that would be very difficult for me to heal. So I cut off from her in 2008. I've never communicated to her since then. And this was one of the most powerful things I did to heal myself. But that meant that I lived without a family. I lived without that closeness and that nurturing that comes from a family. And that has been very, very difficult for me to be without a family. And mm -hmm. people say, well, go create another family. Yeah, you know, but you don't understand the genetic ancestral bloodlines like we do in East Africa and other places of the world, the ancient world, like, you know, China. Family is very important, even in Latin America, you know, and even places in America. So for me to have cut off from my family because of the pedophilia and all the craziness there, it has been very difficult. That's one thing that every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, every holiday, it's a big hole in my heart. You know, and I, I, that's where the 21 activities really comes in handy because then I just choose to self-focus on me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I imagine that's something that you've had to grieve over just that, that loss of family. Yes. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, I can have you back on the show when your new book comes out and, and we can talk about this notion of reparenting because I think that. Um, that's something that my audience would be interested in. I would love to. I really, really connect with you and your audience, Melissa. I want you to know this because, you know, I understand, you know, from when I read your web, you know, the, the stories on your website, I just said, oh, my God, there are people like me. And it was so, so valuable to me because all this time I've been like, people don't understand it. Oh, that's too much. That's too much. Who would do something like that to a baby? You know, but there are people right now, as you and I are speaking, doing that to a baby in some part of the world, if not here in the United States, behind closed doors. Yeah. You know? And mm -hmm. children don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. you know, I certainly didn't. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so this is why I've become an advocate for young children and a very serious one. You know, um, I've joined many organizations. I'm a speaker on, you know, on doing workshops, teaching people about the power of storytelling you know, just different ways to get people, you know, to understand that hurting children this way affects them for the rest of their lives. It's like putting a bullet in a child's head when you start doing some of this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Rose, I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today. And that is, given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I really believe it would be to be self less self-critical because I was so hard on myself, Melissa, so hard. I lived in such deep self-hate and just being against myself in so many terrible ways. 
I did very many detrimental things to myself because I literally was suicidal every day. And so when I look back at that, I wish that I had had more self-compassion and being less self-critical of myself. And having the group that you have now, you know, I wish I had connected with that group, but, you know, we're talking 11 years ago and, you know, I didn't know that there was anybody that had come from Africa and had been violated since they were a baby, you know, and really didn't know that what love is. I don't know what love is. I'm still teaching myself that. And um, that's the part that is the hardest for me because I've never really been able to have a real true loving experience. Mm. And that's what I'm teaching myself. And I have tears behind my eyes because mm. it's almost like, Melissa, it's hard to really love somebody if you don't know what love is. Yeah. And it's hard to get that back. You know, and this is why that journey of self love is so critical for us, you know, especially if we want to draw that loving relationship. I mean, I see it in the movies and people say, oh, that's impossible. There's no such thing as that. But I have friends that have that in their marriages. They have true, deep, loving relationships. It's so awesome to see them, you know. Mm. It's a part of my life that I want to grow back, you know. And so this is one of the journeys I'm, you know, really taking seriously to be able to incorporate love and love with another person into my life. That would just be really big for me. Well, I hope that you're able to find that. And yeah, I mean, it, it's so hard when, I mean, I, I can imagine, you know, in your case where you just started being abused, right? As a baby and you weren't loved the way that, you know, a child is supposed to be. It just doesn't, it doesn't help you later on in life when you're trying to figure out what that's all about and what, you know, what love is. That is true. And not knowing what gender you are. For a long time, I didn't know what gender I was, mm. you know, because it was very confusing. Am I a man? Am I a woman? You know, because they kept switching. When you're in those roles as a sexual, pro young sexual prostitute, they keep changing the roles, you know, according to what fantasy they want. And so, you know, it took me a long time to understand, yes, I'm a woman and I'm very strong inside and resilient, you know, and that doesn't make me a man because I'm resilient and strong. That makes me still a woman, a very strong woman, you know, and that was, you know, four or five years ago when I embraced that concept that I'm a resilient and I'm a strong woman, you know, I'm not a man. And that took me a long time to, to, to be able to release that, that brainwashing you know, that they had um, placed in there for sexual service, you know. So, you know, there are many things. I mean, everybody goes through this in different ways. My student was sexually violated by her uncle, like I told you, and it took her a long time to accept her body, you know. But that day we did the sun visualization, she fell in love with herself. And that's what I really believe Melissa needs to happen is that we fall in love with ourselves because if we can fall in love with ourselves, with all the thing, good, bad, ugly, whatever is going on, then that self-acceptance helps us accept others, you know, and we're able to change and, and start that change process that's so necessary in order to move out of that sexual violence and assault and um, harassment and, and, and rebuild a new life that is free from that. And if I could add something on that, some of us are addicted to being assaulted and, and harassed and violent and being violated. I know I was because that's the only way I knew how to live. So now you have to teach yourself a new way to live, you know, without that. And that's like going into a drug rehab facility, facility, you know, mm. it's the journey of self-love and teaching yourself that you don't need to be harassed every day. You don't need to be um, assaulted and you don't need that violence because that's what people will do to you. They'll fill in that gap if you haven't healed it and resolved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I think that's um, a good analogy that it's like, it, it's like an addiction, you know, and you, you're looking for someone to kind of, to fill that need, you know, because that's all you know, and it's not your fault. You know, people did things to you, they hurt you, and it's it's not your fault that you ended up, you know, the way that you did. 
Um, and now you're the one who's left having to try to work through that and and go through that recovery process, you know, to get through the other side. And, and that's not um, an easy thing to do. Um, but, you know, as we can see in your case, Rose, I mean, you've been able to come a long way from what you've gone through. And I think that just that speaks to the power of being able to heal and how that is a possible a possibility for any of us. Um, so thank you for, you know, just sharing your story with us here today. Thank you for having me, Melissa. And I look forward to, you know, another show with you to bring the reparenting because I really believe that if you can heal childhood trauma, oh my God, you can stand on your own two feet and say, yeehaw, and say, mm -hmm. I can move forward. Because a lot of us are not able to move past our parents and the people that, you know, we love in our families, that we keep staying in that circle. And sometimes it's not healthy for us, especially if those people were aware of our abuse and didn't do anything to help us. They may have not violated us, but they knew it and they let it happen anyway. You know, they didn't come mm -hmm. rescue you. And sometimes that can give a bit, really bitter um, taste, like in one of my um, clients' case. She has a very bad taste towards her mother because her mother, you, you know, never, you know, stepped in for, for her when her stepdad was abusing her at night, you know, my, my, my client. And so we had to talk about that. We had to talk about, you know, why her mother may have not, done, you know, stepped in or what have you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's the case. Yeah. So before I let you go, um, you know, is there a way that people can connect with you or uh, where can they find your book? Well, uh, one of the biggest ways that people can connect with me is through Amazon. Uh, the book is there. It's a download of 99 cents onto your phone. If you want to read the book, I try to make it really inexpensive because I have students that, you know, they, they have a hardship affording things. And I really wanted the book to get out to them as soon as possible. But also you can get the physical book for less than $15. And it's, it's a simple book. I wrote it specifically to help people start rewiring their brains. So there is a repetitive process, but we learn through repetition. So the book is not written to be a literary, you know, masterpiece. It's written to help people start healing their lives. I've had many good reviews. Um, there is a person that said they couldn't put down the book. They had to finish it, you know, within that time. They read it within one hour and they were like, oh, my God, I couldn't put it down because there's just a rush in there. And the rush is just the, you know, the exciting things you can do to heal your life and get out of it. And how I felt about the process that I was in. And the people that abused me, you know, I'm very vocal about it. And so it was, it, you know, when I look back now, I can laugh because, you know, I read the book every now and then because some of the processes are helping me today to make it every day. So there isn't anything in that book that I'm not using. And I have proved the techniques over and over again with my clients, with my students. And I'm, I'm just so happy, you know, to just hear from you and from the people that will, you know, use it, just let me know how, you know, the book was. I'd really appreciate that because, you know, it helps me, you know, fine tune, you know, for other books that I want to write for this uh, group of us who really are still in that recovery process, still in the self-healing game, is as I call it, you know. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll have that linked up on the show notes page. Thank you. Yeah. So just, yeah, thank you again for coming on here and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure that the audience has as well. Yes. And I do, you know, I don't like to apologize, but if any of this was graphic or, you know, hard for anybody to take, I just want you all to remember that there are children behind closed doors that are suffering these things. We may not want to acknowledge it right now, but they are. I have met them in my classroom. And they have disclosed many things to me, including men. Men, I don't want to forget the young little boys that were violated by their mothers or uncles because, or fathers because I've heard those stories in my classrooms. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been altar boys that have been abused by a priest that they were, you know, um, part, you know, who was their priest as they were an altar boy. Mm -hmm. And we have been able to work through their issues. And if I may just mention one of my students, he was 56 years old 
when he found out in my classroom that he had been sexually violated by his mother from the age of four until when he was in my classroom. And he still lives with his mother. And um, imagine from four years old to 56 years old, being of sexual service to your mother because your father left home with another woman and you took his place, is how Jose explained it to me. I'm using another name. That's his name. His real name is not Jose. Okay. But he had tears rolling down his eyes, Melissa, mm-hmm. because it's not like he could leave his mother. She had three strokes. Um, now she's really sick and he's still taking care of her. But one thing I told him was that, you know, he's institutionalized. He's, this is the only life he knows. And so to break away may be very harmful to him. And so I gave him some other techniques to help him cope because sometimes we have gone too far in something. It's too deep. And so what can we do to at least, you know, um, help us live, you know, constructive lives? Okay, for me, I'm institutionalized. So what have I done to help myself? 23 years is a long time, Melissa. Okay, it's an institution. 23 year, you know, 23 years, 23, sorry, 23 years of doing something repetitively since birth. You're in in, in an institution. So how do you move out of that? Well, I have told people you can move out, but you're going to have to create something bigger than just self-love. You're going to have to create an institution for yourself to live in so you can move out of that one safely. And that's what I did these 11, 12 years. I created a beautiful institution for me to shift myself into because I have a subconscious and I did not want to have psychotic breaks and all the things people go through when they shift too fast. So that's something I want to just say just so that people are aware that this process of self-recovery needs to be handled with, with real care. Don't just go and say, you know, I want this overnight, because that could really be traumatic for your subconscious, especially if you have been um, institutionalized in this self-abuse for many years. So that's mm-hmm. my word of caution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, you know, just and thank you for the work that you're doing today to help these people. Thanks. It's really great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for having me on the show. And um, we'll talk later. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 112. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Rose M to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope you were able to take something away from this episode. I really like this idea of becoming president of your own life and really just kind of taking charge of what your life is going to look like going forward. One of the things that excites me every day is knowing that I can control what my life looks like and to have the opportunity to work on me every day and try to constantly improve to become more of the person that I desire to be. And I like this tool that Rose has used, the 21 Activities. And I would encourage you, if you're struggling to focus on doing things for yourself and to focus on self-care, to create a list of 21 things that you can do just for you to begin to have that self-focus that Rose was talking about that was so important. And if 21 things seems like a lot, then start off small, but the point is to do things that are just for you and to become comfortable doing that. Okay, and come back in two weeks for the next episode. I'm not sure who that's going to be with just yet, but be sure to come back for that one. And don't forget to grab the free resource I've created for you. It's called the Top 10 Most Common Strategies My Guests Have Used for Overcoming Past Trauma. It's a great place to get started if you're looking for some strategies that can help you in your healing, as they have helped my guests. And you can find that also on the show notes page. So again, that's thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Rose M. And lastly, also don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And, as always, have hope.